It is the evening of the 13th of July 1977 and a thunderstorm is forming over New York City. Lightning can be seen flashing near the Hudson River. It strikes the Buchanan's South substation and two circuit breakers are tripped. As Consolidated Edison scrambled to fix the issue, the lightning strike would be the first in a number of unlikely strikes that would ultimately result in 1.5 billion in today's dollars worth of damage, over 3,700 people arrested for rioting and looting, and a cultural landmark that would shape destitute city and even some of the music we listen to. Of course, today I'm looking at the 1977 New York City blackout. My name is John, and welcome to Plainly Difficult. New York, New Broke. So the 1970s weren't a particularly great time financially for the city of New York. By 1975, the city was close to defaulting on its debts and was in a financial crisis. Crime was on the rise and the middle classes had fled to the suburbs, hitting the city's tax income. The deficit was at at least 600 million, but it was a bit of an open secret that that was just a tip of a much bigger financial iceberg. Others have covered this period greater in detail, so I won't dive any deeper apart from New York was short on cash and this lack of funds spilled out into the streets. The city was in decay and the average person on the street knew it. Subways dilapidated, police overworked, the streets dirty, and all of this played into a general lack of pride in the city. I mean, who could blame them? If the authorities didn't care, then why should we? And this would create fertile ground for the disaster that would unfold. A storm in the city. It is the evening of the 13th of July 1977, and the Indian Point nuclear power station is supplying households via power lines and substations throughout New York State and the city. One of these substations is at Buchanan South, Westchester County. It is tasked with converting the high voltage, some 344,000 volts of electricity from the power station down to a more usable commercial voltage. The substation mostly sends electricity off to New York City. This relatively normal but humid and warm July evening gave way to lightning. It lit up the sky, lightning bolts reached out to the ground and one of its targets was the Buchanan South substation. At roughly 9.17 in the evening, the strike blew out two circuit breakers. These didn't reclose really as they were meant to. Obviously this is not good, but not terrible. Lightning can't strike twice, right? Well, in today's story, uh, also no. But probably worse for New York, the lightning struck something else, a power line. This was two 345 kilovolt transmission lines. One reclosed, but the other didn't. This resulted in two other lines becoming overloaded. The load was rather high due to people using aircon in the July heat. A fast start generator was attempted to be brought online, but remote starting failed. If that wasn't bad enough, another lightning strike hit the Sprain Brook substation in Yonkers. This also took out two more lines, of which only one once again restarted. This yet again increased the load on other infrastructure. It was ever becoming apparent that Con Edison needed to load shed. Initially a 5% power reduction followed by an 8% reduction at 9.19pm took place. Another substation trips due to the thermal overload. But by 24 minutes past 9, this was not working, and the system was still very much overloaded. The city's own power plants couldn't pick up the slack, and with supplemental power lines also overwhelmed, it was just a matter of time. Ravenswood No. 3, also known as Big Alice, capable of supplying 990 megawatts, shut down, taking with it the lights of New York City and this was around half nine in the evening. Desperately, Con Edison operators tried to restore power, but this wouldn't be for quite a while. 
darkness. LaGuardia and Kennedy airports had to be shut down. Streetlights were out, tunnels were shut, the subway ground to a halt and alarm security systems stopped working. At Shia Stadium, the Mets were playing the Cubs and losing the game in the sixth inning. This too was plunged into darkness. Many trying to return home from the city were now stranded with very few trains running. The only lights were from cars and the odd buildings that had backup generators. However, the darkness was ripe for being exploited for crime. Most shop owners had closed up and gone home, consequently leaving their juicy stock unprotected. Gangs made their way out onto the streets attacking passers-by and many regular people took the opportunity to loot and smash up their local shops. Throughout the night, many would take to lighting kerosene burners, candles, small bonfires, cars, shops and houses. In all, over 1,000 cases of arson would be logged, looting ranged from local convenience stores to over 40 brand new cars being stolen from a car dealership. Other cars were jacked into traffic to be used as battering rams for more protected shop fronts. As the night dragged on, emergency services quickly became overwhelmed. Crown Heights and Bushwick were hit really hard, with tens of stores smashed up in just a few blocks. But vandalism, muggings and arson hit across the city at approximately 31 neighbourhoods. Two blocks of Broadway in Brooklyn were ablaze and during the carnage 550 police officers were injured in the mayhem and well over 3,700 were arrested. The looting ran all the way into the morning and the day of the 14th of July. In all, the blackout would last 25 hours and a total of 300 million of 1977 dollars, nearly 1.5 billion today, worth of damage was inflicted on the city. On top of that, there was one murder with the shooting of Dominic Kiscone in Carroll Gardens, of which the crime is still unsolved till this very day. The first area to get power back was Queens at 7am on the 14th. But why was the 1977 blackout so crime-filled, especially when compared with the blackout a decade earlier, which was held up as an example of communities coming together? Well, it was probably the economic situation in the city in the late 1970s that bred disdain amongst its inhabitants, who saw the blackout as an opportunity to get some stuff they couldn't afford, even if it was at the expense of the very communities in which they lived. The spark, so to speak, that caused the fire, the original substation at Buchanan, which failed to reclose its circuit breakers, was due to an incorrectly fastened lock nut that was missed likely due to cutbacks on maintenance throughout a decade of financial issues. Of course, there's more to it, as even the overloaded lines were a sign of improper planning for such an event. Con Edison would investigate the cause and implement improved practices and infrastructure strengthening. Mayor Beam would blame Con Edison, calling the event gross negligence, but Beam would take on some of the heat himself and leave office the same year. Interestingly, in 2019, on the 42nd anniversary of the blackout, Con Edison treated West Manhattan's inhabitants to a reenactment to 73,000 people. How nice of them. The blackout would inspire a number of musicians, both directly and indirectly. Hometown hero David Bowie's song Blackout has been linked to the event, although Bowie himself never really gave a definitive answer. He would say, I can't in all honestly say that it was the NY one though it is entirely likely that the image locked itself inside my head. So buying this CD for B-roll might have been a bit of a waste. What the fuck? So the disaster scale, I'm going to give it a bad day at the office. Or possibly dumpster fire due to the amount of arson. And the legacy scale is going to be a number eight. This is a Plain Difficult production. All videos on the channel are Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike License. Plain Difficult videos are produced by me, John, and are currently quite pleasant corner of southern london uk i have patrons and youtube members so i'd like to thank you for your financial support as well as the rest of you for tuning in every week for your dose of me talking i have instagram and twitter and if you're enjoying this outro song then please feel free to head on over to my second channel made by john where you can listen to it in full and all that's left to say is thank you for watching and mr music man play us out please
Side 2